the session dr shuv prat sarkar honorable principal dr joyita basu sri agroshin mahavidyalaya my fellow colleagues and my dear students we have come to the final day of the online lecture series that was organized by the department of english sri agroshin mahavidyalaya and today we have a special lecture on bartol brecht the good woman of shizwan i mean uh, this modern european drama itself is a very complex thing and i do not want to say anything about the drama because the right man is here in this virtual platform to share elaborately on the drama and on the different aspects of it before we formally proceed with the program i have i would request our honorable principal dr joyita basu to extend her very warm welcome to the participants and to the distinguished speaker in this virtual platform madam good afternoon everyone and welcome dr shubhabrut sarkar department of english rishi bankim chandra college এবং আমার প্রিয় ছাত্রছাত্রী এবং শিক্ষকরা সকলকে আমার অভিনন্দন এবং ধন্যবাদ জানাই ডক্টর শুভব্রত সরকার স্যারকে যিনি কনসেন দিয়েছেন এই আজকের এই লেকচারে পার্টিসিপেট করার জন্য এবং তার নলেজকে আমাদের স্টুডেন্টদের কাছে এক্সটেন্ড করার জন্য আজকে যে টপিক সেটা ব্রেকস দ্য গুড উইমেন অফ সিচুয়ান এই যে টপিকটা সেই টপিকটা সম্পর্কে অনেকটাই হয়তো স্টুডেন্টরা লীনা ম্যাডামের কাছ থেকে জেনেছ আশা করি স্যার আজকে যে যে জায়গার থেকে আলোচনা করবেন সেটা তোমাদের প্রত্যেককে খুব উপকারে আসবে এবং ইউজফুল হবে তোমরা সবাই মন দিয়ে শোনো এবং যা যা প্রশ্ন থাকবে স্যারকে করবে এবং প্রত্যেকেই এক এক করে করবে কোনো অবশ্যই ডিসিপ্লিন মেনটেন করে যেন প্রোগ্রামটা হয় সেটা দেখবে স্যারকে আবারও ওয়েলকাম জানাচ্ছি যে আপনি এই আমাদের এই অ্যাপিলকে অ্যাকসেপ্ট করেছেন এবং আমাদের মতো কলেজের একজন স্টুডেন্টদের কাছে আপনার সেই ভ্যালুয়েবল নলেজ আপনি প্রদান করবেন ওয়েলকাম এগেন স্যার ফিউল Dr. Sharkar is a very distinguished professor in the field of English literature and he has an experience of 22 years of teaching the students the undergraduate level and 14 years, I'm sorry, 12 years of teaching the postgraduate courses. He was awarded PhD for his thesis, European Influence on Post-1960 American Drama. He was a recipient of Teacher Research Grant, October, November 1997. Awarded by the American Studies Research Center, Hyderabad, and has completed, completed a UGC minor research project entitled Impact of European Drama on Indian Theatre. He has presented and published some research articles on literature, drama, poetry, fiction, performance, and ecological theatre. His areas of interest is almost versatile because it includes European drama, American drama, Indian drama, British romantic literature, Dalit studies, literature from the margins of class, caste and gender, performance theory, Marxist literary criticism, modern linguistics, ELT, that is English language teaching, and experimental drama and theater arts. So with his vast erudition and his scholarly experience, I would not like to delay any further. I would request, sir, to start his wonderful lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Professor Lina Hadri, for such a wonderful introduction. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. 
Jaita Basu, Principal Sri Agrashan Mahavidyalaya, for giving me this opportunity. Meeting the students for a teacher is such a great opportunity, and that too with the text written by Bertolt Brecht. So, Madam, I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to your students. I would like to thank Dr. Professor Lina Bhaduri for this opportunity she has extended. The topic for today's discussion is Bertolt Brecht. So, Bertolt Brecht is such a vast area. And in our theater studies, especially of the 20th century, he is at par with two other great dramatists, George Bernard Shaw and Samuel Beckett. His contribution to the development of world theater is such that his plays are translated in almost all the languages, major languages of the world. And his dramaturgy, his theatrical technique, his political theater, his radical dialectical epic theater has influenced not only the theatrical culture all over the world, but also it has led to such revolutionary politics all around the world based on the ideals of Marxism. So he's, by his own confession, a Marxist theater maker, which he prefers to call rather than a playwright. So his works are plenty, and he is remarkable as a poet, as a short story writer, as a playwright, and as a theoretician. So his development as a playwright, poet, and artist, his involvement with politics, economics, and new morality, his involvement with art and culture, and finally his development of aesthetics, theater aesthetics and aesthetics related to the political culture, subculture, of course, give the future generation of readers and learners a great opportunity. His development in the early years of Nazi uprising in East Germany, and later on his life in exile in Russia, in all the Scandinavian countries, and finally in America, where period that allowed Brecht not only have a universal experience of various cultures, but also led to shaping and reshaping and working on a theatrical culture that will be instrumental in the development of theater. So influences on Brecht are many from the traditional medieval theater practices, Italian Commedia dell'Arte, to the Shakespearean theater, and then to the continental theater, especially the Chinese forms, and the Japanese Noha theater, Kabuki theater, the Balinese theater, and of course, Indian Kathakali dance tradition. All these were influential in making of Brecht as a playwright. His early plays, four early plays he wrote, but he was not the writer of an epic theater when he was writing his early plays, like Ball, Drums in the, Mid in the Night, In the Jungle of the Cities, Man Equals Man. All these are written in Germany against the backdrop of the rising of the new political culture led by Adolf Hitler. So it, these plays were trying to search for an alternative amidst political repression. He was also related to musical theater. And in his American years, he did contribute to the development of the musical theater of America. While in America, he developed his new plays like Three Penny Opera, one of the most popular plays of Bertolt Brecht. And this play has its adaptation even in Bangla, Teen Poishar Pala. Most of the plays of Bertolt Brecht has been translated into English. So during these American years, he composed music theater pieces with Kurt Weil, like Three Penny, the Three Penny Opera, The Rise and Fall of the City of Mahagony, 
Marxism became closely related to the development of Brecht as a theater practitioner. And his political theater then produced plays like St. Joan of the Stockyard, The Decision, The Mother, Mother based on the famous novel by that name. In his plays, we find a kind of protest, revolt, and he is regarded as the playwright of the social revolt by Robert Brustain. Robert Brustain, in his book, The Theater of the Revolt, classifies European drama into three types, the drama of messianic revolt, the drama of existential revolt, and finally, the drama of social revolt, and places Bertolt Brecht in the category of drama of social revolt. His other plays like Fear and Misery of the Third Reich, Senora Karar's Rifle, The Resistible Rise of Arthur Uy, and Shevik in the Second World War are all political plays written against the rise of Nazism and fascism in Europe. In his later years in America and after the end of the Second World War, when he returned back to Germany, his plays were produced. And during this period, the most fertile period of text, he composed Life of Galileo, based on the historical character. He produced The Good Woman, Good Person of Sashua, Mother Courage and Her Children, Mr. Puntila and His Man Matti, and his most popular parable play, The Caucasian Chalk Circle. The last masterpiece of Bertolt Brecht was The Days of the Commune. So these were the works that actually contributed to the making of Brechtian theater. With different names we call Brechtian theater. The theater that is included in our syllabus and is a topic for today's discussion. The good person of Sheshua, or as Eric Bentley has translated the play as The Good Woman of Satsua, so this play is a parable play. And together with the Caucasian Chalk Circle, this play, of course, is one of the best plays written by Bertolt Brecht. So many plays that were written by Bertolt Brecht during these years are, of course, years of dark times and plays of dark times. But these plays are demonstrations, not propaganda displays of the messianic type or the existential type. So this playwright's life and his works coincided with the most violent and dramatic half century in the German history or even in the world history. He was concerned to create a new kind of art capable of reflecting the changing realities of an ever-changing modern world. So he wrote that he lived in dark times and the briefest historical outline of his time will demonstrate that from, say, his birth, 1898, to his death, 1956, he did contribute some of the best plays that are really remarkable. In order to understand Brechtian theater, it is essential for us to know about the key concepts of Brechtian theater. So this theater is a different type of theater. First of all, it is un-Aristotelian. This type of theater is un-Aristotelian. That means whatever Aristotle wrote about the structure of a play does not meet Brecht's requirement. So he is anti-structuralist in that way. And his writing plays that are meant not to create cathartic effect, to arouse pity and fear, to affect the catharsis of such emotion. Neither does Brecht intend to create a kind of laughter to generate a sense of happiness. Rather, it is Brecht who will lead us into this world of problems, problems that require solution, require intervention. But the solutions are not suggested by the playwright. Instead, his theories present the readers and practitioners of theater with a series of interrelated terms 
approaching these terms, one must keep in mind the German aesthetic theory related to theater. So in his famous work, A Short Orgulum for Theater, and the other essays that he wrote that are compiled in John Willett's Brecht on theater, we find the theories that are in practice. For a critic, for a theoretician, to be a practitioner of the theater arts is of course a difficult one. But Brecht was primarily a poet, a theater maker, and a theory maker. So he was making theories that were set against the norms that Aristotle has set for the well-made plays. So his plays are not well-made plays. Rather, his plays are plays in the making, rehearsals on the stage that requires immediate action, intervention, and solution. But these solutions are not provided by the playwright. Rather, these solutions are left for the audience, each according to his need, each according to his or her belief and commitment. So solutions will come from the below, not from the above. Playwrights are usually puppeteers who hold the strings of the characters, create the plot, and keep a tag on the emotions of the spectators and never allow the spectators to move out of the plot. So in the theater houses, we are all stuck. Once the curtain is open, we are encountered with the rectangular box. We find stories, dramatic stories represented and in a well-made structure with exposition, rising action, crisis, climax, and then dinoma. The final result, of course, in tragedy is the arousal of pity and fear. In case of comedy, arousal of laughter. In Brechtian theater, that structure is totally episodic. And this episodic structure allows each episode to become independent and comment on the definite social problem with a dominant gestus or gestic stance. This is done in order to create a kind of boxing match-like quality that the theater is all about. A theater based on contradictions. We remember William Blake saying that without contraries, there can be no progression. And Mao Zedong talks about on contradictions. Brechtian theory also talks about this contradiction that is at the core of theatrical experience. Without contradiction, there can be no theater following Bernard Shaw's view that no conflict, no drama. These contradictions that are kept in a dialectical manner in each episode with a thesis, antithesis, and set in antagonistic terms in a set of binary juxtaposition, conflicting each other, is kept open in full view of the audience. And this is done with the help of alienation effect. Alienation effect can be regarded as the keystone of Christian theatricality. This is a word that has been derived from the German effect. From the outset, Brex tried to create a kind of theater which would rather encourage the audience to look at what was being presented in such a way that they would draw conclusions about the society in which they lived. So these questions are then introduced to the spectators. So it is quite impossible to make the reproduction of real life events. We know that theater is, as Aristotle himself confessed, based on imitation of an action. And Plato was doubtful. And he said that it is thrice removed from reality, a copy of a copy of a copy. And Rex was also concerned with this platonic doubt regarding skepticism regarding theater. And he stated that theater is something that is artificial. It is an artifice created by human beings. So the question of real life events being presented realistically on the stage is out of question for the purpose of art. And therefore, Brecht said that it is something that comes in the mind of the audience. An audience should have a spectral illumination, a kind of critical attitude at the site of the play. This result was, of course, the alienation effect, one of the most 
of course, misunderstood terms in Brechtian vocabulary. By alienation effect, what Brecht meant was to separate drama, theater arts from the, from the world of well-made plays, from the world of theatrical illusion, so that the spectator is made aware from the very beginning that they are watching a play rather than they are, they are actually seeing a dramatic action. So instead of dramatic, it is a narrative that dominates to produce this kind of alienation effect in theater. Alienation effect, this is achieved when the audience is encouraged again and again through the theatrical experience to re-examine the preconceptions and to look at the familiar things in a new way. So it is theater that makes things strange. And without this sense of strangeness, without this alienation effect, the audience cannot even understand what is there. So seeing is seeing. But recognition of the problem is more important for Brecht. So this requires some kind of acting where the character will not only represent the character, the actor will not only represent the character, but also dialectically analyze the character and present the viewpoint of the character in full view of the audience. So it is like showing something that is to be shown to the audience rather than hiding that behind the, behind the theatrical illusions. It is not the magical theater of illusions that Brex talked about. He knew about the dangers of such theatrical illusions. He argued that, what, that it prevented the actor from commenting on his character and stops his performance from having an active purpose. Therefore, the narrative is used. Even in the good person of Sashua, we find how this narrative is woven by the characters who are present. Wong is the character, the water seller, who keeps on weaving the action and keeps on reminding the audience that they are actually seeing the story of a good woman of Sashua, whom the gods visited. So this type of alienation effect is to separate the, the consciousness of the audience from the subjective action and to make them aware objectively and generate some kind of complex seeing, a kind of perspective that will help them to arrive at their own judgment rather than following the judgment given by the playwright. So it is a question that is set forth to the audience and without this alienation effect, the questions cannot be answered by the spectators. This parable play, the good person, the good woman of Sheshua, of course, requires this type of attention, requires this type of critical hearing, critical audience, critical viewing in order to recognize what is there in the play. So it is like a football match. Anything can happen. So two parties are fighting, the good and the bad. No, it is not the question of good and the bad. The good and the absolute good, as Hegel has produced, no. Right and the wrong, no. It is not a conflict that is there, generated, that has a response on the moral level. Rather, it is a conflict that requires political intervention that will help the spectators to form their own judgments. Therefore, in rehearsals, Brecht encourages actors to present their stories in the third person, prefacing each speech. Say, when the actor is rehearsing, he will be using he said or she said. So he's like a news reporter. So on the TV channel, when we find the news reporter reading some news event, along with the dramatic visuals, we find that the stories are more seen by us in a very complex manner, rather than accepting whatever is said. So this playwright uses narrator and the narrative in order to dramatize. While Aristotelian theater is the dramatic theater, Brechtian theater is a narrative theater that narrates the story and dissects, anatomizes the story in full view of the audience. This alienation effect requires a different approach from the directors, from the designers, from the theater makers. And Brecht always wanted to ensure that what is presented has quotation marks around it. That is, what happened? So I am the playwright. I will be telling the story. I will be narrating the story. I will be presenting or dramatizing the story in such a way 
that as if it appears as a fresh page of a history book chapter. So it is like going back to your history book and reading the history book page with a new insight, with a new light in order to search for eternal truths. So usually the audience is given some kind of unshakable eternal truths and Brexit is talking about breaking the hegemony of such truth and through the alienation effect he will be achieving this. This theatre is called epic theatre and this epic theatre, the notion of epic theatre is again much debated in theatre. By epic theatre what Brecht actually meant was to create a kind of theatre that will contain episodes jump from one location to another location and will not have the unities that were suggested by Aristotle, the unities of time, place, action, even character or place. So his works eschews the smooth inevitability of 19th century drama and he argues that only the epic theatre could express the bewildering dis disjointedness of our human life, modern life. So this idea was of course not new, even in Germany we have a previous experiment in the hands of Arvind Piscator who was trying to create Lehurstuk or teaching place. Based on Elizabethan popular theatre, Brex gradually developed his essential point of epic theatre in order to develop stories as a collage of contrasting stories narrated in a dramatic form whose comment and style and approach will deliberately be very critical and conflicting images, elements, gestus, gestus means the gestic stance, the political positions, all these interruptions or interpretations are therefore encouraged. This text is set against action, music, so usually after the Wagnerian revolution in theatre, we find that music became a part, integral part of theatre and as the lighting, designing and costuming became more and more popular in the theatre of the West End and the Naturalist Theatre, theatrical illusion became very popular among the audience. Brechtian alienation effect and the epic theatre will try to shatter such illusions. So you can see the light man, okay, visible in front of you using the light sources. You can see the costuming on stage so that the characters reveal the actors and how they are transformed into characters. So costuming is functional, lighting is functional, even the stage prop is functional. Brex thought that the spectators are more intelligent and they can construct their own sense of realities, create a space, a time and can be transported not subjectively but objectively and critically like the students of history. So in his famous plays like Life of Galileo or the Caucasian Chalk Circle, Mother Courage and Her Children, even the mother, he has this representation of contradictions that are there in the political action. Such contradictions recognize the key drama, key to drama and the conflict of opposites. Say one group wants one thing, even in Good Woman of Sashua, we find that one group wants something, the other group wants something else. And there is a conflict between these two desires, between these two resolves. And there is, of course, the third position, the possibility of the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. The theatre's role, according to Brecht, is to present all these as they are, but not in the same illusory manner that is seen in the theatre of 19th century, especially in the Victorian theatre and the 20th century well-made theatre of the West End. So his earlier works, we find that clash is registered with an excess of sentimentality, with of course cynicism. But this intellectual and, and sentimental flaw that he soon discovered were, got replaced in his later evolution of the play when he was developing his concept of epic theatre. Therefore in his mature works, this interest in contradiction and dialectic becomes more positive. And Brecht's reading of the writers from France, especially Voltaire, as well as the reading of classical Chinese philosophy, 
made him clear that this is one side of the hand and there will be of course the other side of the hand also and these two hand sides should be placed side by side so that the preference is almost equal and the audience is asked to solve the puzzle to solve the problem and to select one side of the hand according to the requirement according to the necessity his greatest characters are constructed in terms of contradictions say for example galileo the historian says that he was a legendary scientist but rex galileo is not that he is a man full of carnal desires a man who can enjoy a warm bath who can have glass full of milk a man who can cheat others who can just plagiarize telescope and sell that in the court as his own invention and earn something when the instruments of torture are shown to galileo against his famous doctrine that the earth is not still earth is on move galileo recants galileo does not stand like a hero he does not want to become a martyr sacrifice on the altar of religion rather he disputes but when he is shown the instruments of torture he recants he says whatever i said i said that in folly so i will revise that so he purchases more time just at the site of the instruments of torture this galileo the legendary scientist the heroic scientist is taking a u turn and recanting whatever he is he has said earlier and now he gets more time to write his discourse after this recantation when he comes out andrea his disciple says that we all waited for you to say that the earth is on move it is revolving around the sun we were waiting for your heroic proclamation revolution might have begun and rex galileo standing there in his depressed mind mood says unhappy is the land that is in need of heroes so it is not a world a political world the choice is left for the audience so whether it is a heroic deed or whether this is the most unheroic deed therefore this legendary scientist one side of the hand of the palm and on the other side of the palm we have a normal human being a flesh and man flesh and blood human being who is who is desiring to live and he purchases life he works on his discourse completes his discourse and finally hands over the discourse to his disciple who crosses the border and smuggles that galileo has his doubts whether this will reach the right hand or will it be taken by the rulers of the world when the atom bomb was a reality brex said that in life of galileo i did suggest the same thing science is both good and bad it is for the users who use science so this legendary scientist galileo is also treated in terms of contradictions episodes in the plays are presented with the help of gestus another key term in brechtian theater so one of the most difficult terms this word gestus in brechtian vocabulary this is at its most superficial this comes very close to the english word gesture so a character might take some gestures so in bharat muni natya shastra we have such gestures the rasa that can be aesthetically transported to the audience who can relish the rasa such as shringar rasa hasya rasa so these are gestures so brechtian theater contains gestus in its very simple form it can be compared with the oriental concept of bhava and the rasa but this concept of gestus has its political connotation it is like a pointed finger okay a uh, shrugged shoulder so turn back and so so type of some kind of abhinaya some kind of gesture this also refers to something deeper a kind of physical embodiment of the relationship between people and society so every scene was composed in terms of gestus every episode contains a dominant gestus each gestus captures a particular set of interlocking attitudes and the sum total of these provides the audience with a chart of the society that is portrayed 
So understanding the gestures of any particular moment is an essential task in directing or acting in one of any of Brecht's plays. So in The Good Woman of Sheshua, every action that is there on the stage is minimalist, but it has maximum impact on the audience because each minimalist set of action is a kind of pictorial image expressing some dominant sentiment, emotion, or political stance. So thus, the way the water seller stands, so it is raining, and the water seller has no one to buy rain water. Rainwater is abundant, so the water seller cannot sell water. So his condition is presented with that gestus, a dominant gesture, where he is showing his inability to sell a commodity in the market where the commodity is naturally available. And then we find in the scene the appearance of Shante on when she purchases water for her beloved, a cup of water from Wong. Wong reports that to the gods. And he says that she is really a fool because she is purchasing, she had purchased that water when it was raining. Shente had purchased the water, of course, to support Wong. Wong could not sell a single glass of water on that particular day. So around such gestures, he presents uh, characters. In Mother Courage and Her Children, we have this. So she hauls the cart around the stage for the last time, still looking for business. Just look at it. So this Mother Courage, she is still looking for business and she is taking the cart from one place to another place. And she is looking for business. She has lost her children because of this business that is done on the basis of war. She is moving from one war field to another war field, collecting the items from the war field and selling that in her canteen. So a poor production would make this, very, of course, very pathetic. But Brex wanted to express a very troubling gesture. I remember a scene where Mother Courage has to present a kind of uh, emotion that is very difficult to present on the stage. And Helen Wiggle was to perform that role. The information about the death of her son. Okay, when the body of the son is displayed in front of her, she cannot disclose that this is her son because if she discloses this, what will happen? Other children, okay, Mother Courage had other children, they will be targeted by the enemies and she might be arrested, her shop might close. So she had to conceal her agony and not recognize this child of her own. So she uses this gestures. So she will be repressing her sorrow. But once the body is taken out after the recognition parade, she cries aloud. And this is a deep cry that comes out from her that makes the contradiction between these two actions very possible, very foregrounded. So telling the story in Brechtian style is of course difficult. Everything in Brecht does not hang on the story. The plot makers okay, of well-made plays after the Wagnerian revolution and the naturalistic theatre movement has been always on the plot. Even Aristotle in his classification of drama, while identifying the kinds, while identifying the elements of tragedy stated that there are six elements, plot, character, thought, diction, melody, and spectacle, and places these in terms of arrangement, chronological arrangement, based on graded inequality of importance, placing plot on the top of the hierarchy. So plot is all in Aristotle's play. In case of Brecht, the plot is not all. Everything is told even with the help of captions, slides, narratives, okay, voiceovers, the stories are told. And furthermore, there are songs, plenty, in The Good Woman of Sejua, where we have the narration of the events, even the asides, the comments, the reaction of the characters, these are presented through the songs. So telling the story is not so important because the story usually hangs on the plot. So both the story and plot, these are replaced by episodic action. Brecht knew that the theatre audience wants to find out what happens next. 
okay this is generally question and suspense is generated by the playwrights so when we watch the plays of say hitchcock or the writers of well made play even shaw everything hangs on the plot so story is kept intact so we begin with a beginning there is a middle and then there is an end necessary and probable action they follow each other in a sequence logically tied together so there is no flaw no digression tragic emotion or comic emotions these are all kept intact in a well made flow plot audience according to brecht wants to find out what happens next and what will happen after the error is committed especially in well made plays in tragedies but in brecht this question was replaced by another question so what will happen next that is not solution but what will happen next will have something to happen after that so cause and effect relationship will be there but there are possibilities of something not happening so audience wants to know to find out what happens next and should also remember what did not happen so will this happen this way or will that happen that way if the audience is given this further challenge and is pushed to think rather than to feel the audience can have a kind of experience through the brain a kind of cerebral experience of the theatrical action where the theater maker will allow the audience to participate in the process of theater making so brechtian theater is of course meta theater it questions the legitimacy of the theatrical act what is the purpose of theater brecht might ask so is it just to create a kind of stage illusion entertainment 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 or is it just to go beyond that scope of entertainment just to teach 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 or preach theater has been doing this propagandist theater has been teaching preaching while the well made plays have been entertaining entertaining brecht wanted to trot on a ground in between teaching preaching and and entertainment and the ground that he found was of course epic theater where the story is told in such a way that there are alternatives and the story itself is contradictory in the episodes if you just take out one episode in those episodes you will find a story in itself complete in itself so it will not lead on to other in this story also there is a cause and effect relationship so we have the hero in falling in love with a hero and then she is getting pregnant and the hero coming back after becoming rich searching for the heroine and not finding the heroine just listening to the cry and then taking the heroic gesture complaining to the court and the boy is taken another boy is taken to the court analyzed and then the entire judicial process is on so we have the telling of the story the dramatic storytelling taking the the backstage rather than the narrative in contradiction taking the central stage in brechtian theater so playing one thing after another usually we find that a series of episodes are played one after another in brechtian theater let us now go into the play proper in order to understand what does this mean in this story we have wang the water seller who is eagerly awaiting the arrival of the gods when the gods really turn up no one will give or offer some kind of refuse to the gods so the people of this space of this town that is almost a modern town modern european town having the traditional values of the of the chinese world so when the gods arrive they do not get any kind of refuge not even a bed for the night so when the water sellers he runs away in shame a prostitute shen te say, says that she will put the gods up but uh, she soon confesses that uh, she is a bad woman of course she is a prostitute in the eyes of the society she is a bad woman and yet to the gods as gods are provided safe refuge a bed for their stay they regard sente as the only good woman in shejua so when this woman says that sente says that she will not be able to remain good forever because she is poor she does not have money the gods generously give her money 
And with this money, she buys a tobacco shop. She becomes a tobacconist. Soon when she becomes empowered with money and opens this tobacco shop, we find that her neighbors take advantage of her generosity. Naturally, in the first episode, we find cigarettes are stolen, debts are mounted up, people come and simply loot her, exploit her. Wang is uh, hiding in great terror because he has seen that if the gods return again, he cannot just prove that this woman has remained God. good. Gods want to know whether it is possible to remain good if the person has all the good gifts of modern civilization, that is capital, that is money. Can a person remain good if the person becomes rich? So the bourgeois values that are attacked. Now the shop is seen full of sleeping bodies. So eight members of a family come and take rest, sleep in that shop. So there is the invention of the cousin, Shwita. Okay, this Shwita is a creation who appears, the cousin of Shente. Shente and Shwita, they are not present at a time because Shente has disguised herself as Shwita. So Shwita arrives and with policeman's approval, what he does? Throws these rickly, these people who have taken shelter. So in third act, we third episode, we find a public park where son a young man, an unemployed pilot in tattered clothes. So he is just shaking off the attention of two prostitutes. Shente sees that this person is having some suicidal tendency. He wants to hang himself. So naturally, Shente, the kind, good woman of Sheshua, she falls in love with this man, son, and wants to save this unemployed pilot. She quickly falls in love with him. It starts to rain. We find Wang appearing on the stage, trying to sell water in the rain. This night, again, in a dream, Wang tells the god that Shente is in love, is in love with that young man, Sun, and she has become the angel of the slums. They want to hear more about Shwita, what business to do with an upright and honorable life. So we find that soon Shente returns. Okay, so they are doubling. When Shente is there on the stage, Shwita is not there. Shwita is trying to balance what Shente is doing. Shente is too kind, generous, while Shwita is more practical and rational. So Shente discovers that Wang has been driven out of the baker's shop and that his arm has been broken. So she rages against the onlookers for being silent. Sun's mother arrives and asks Shen, for uh, Shente for $500 so that this man, unemployed pilot, can fly again. And see what she does? She is not a very rich person. She has just a tobacco shop and whatever she's earning by selling cigars is being looted. So she gives $200 and says that Shwita will have to raise the rest. So rest of the money will be raised by Shwita. So good re cannot remain good in our country. That is a comment made. She sings a song. So son comes to visit her and there is this demand for $500 because uh, he also wants an employment. And Shwita offers that but raises money by selling the shop. In the process, she discovers that Shun does not love her. Okay. Shente discovers that this is not a love, this is just a kind of opportunity that Sun is using in order to get money from her. It also emerges that Wang, that water seller, had lied about his arms to get compensation. That means his arm was not broken, there was no fracture. Shwita tells the baker, who is interested in Shente, that uh, she has got become bankrupt, but somehow she could arrange meal for two. And then son hears about this, he persuades Shente to run away with him, elope. So in love, she does so. There is on the way to her wedding, Shente describing her fear, but also her hopes in a cheap restaurant. By sixth episode, we find that she and Shente, they drink uh, to the future. And 
as they wait for Shweta, their special guest, son gets drunk and treats Shweta so badly. And when, particularly when she asks for money, two hundred dollars back, so we find a kind of breach, a contradiction. So everywhere she is being betrayed, and yet she remains good throughout. She wants to give that money to the old couple, and son wants that money for himself. So left alone, they sing in a desperate song about waiting until the moon is green and the new world to be born. Born, a romantic kind of dream. So in a dream, Wang asks the gods, "If Shente is too good for this world, they reply that suffering ennobles that all will end well. However, Shente is bankrupt, and son, that lover who has taken money, has vanished." By seventh episode, we find that the baker appearing, keen to help and offering a blank check, which she refuses. See, the baker is trying to help her out, but she refuses. She is still in love with son, and reveals that she has become pregnant by him. When Wang turns up with a boy who has been abandoned, Shente takes him, but tells Wang to fetch his father. So again and again, she is repeating her mistake. The old couple arrive, dragging sacks of tobacco that they want to keep in the shop. Shente then reluctantly accepts, but when she sees the child scavenging for food in the dustbin, she declares her determination, determination to treat her own son better. So she is the person who is learning lesson. So looking at this child that has not got good treatment, she is actually planning to give good treatment to her own son, not yet born. So she says that I will fight. I will keep on fighting, at least for my own sake. If I have to be as sharp as a tiger, but her action is just the opposite. Wang returns with the child's father and two children, but Shweta says that from now on they will all work to earn his generosity and claims. So Wang keeps on seeing, visiting the dreams, and the narrative is done in such a way that Wang keeps on reminding the audience that the story of Shente. And Shweta, this story is being narrated by him, with the presence of the god. His proposal to make the principles easier to fulfill is finally rejected, and Shweta has turned the store into a tobacco factory. So he's a hardworking, the same person. Shweta is a male. So in Twelfth Night, we find Viola taking the disguise of a male to survive in the court of Orsino. So in order to survive in this world, Shente also sees that. The disguise of Swita is probably important for her survival. So Swita, with his hard work, has turned the store into a tobacco factory. He has also employed Sun. Remember the Sun, the person who has refused, who has abandoned Shente. So gradually Sun, who has done so well, he also become he also becomes a good overseer. So, son becomes gradually a different person. So, the valorization of work culture is also there, and son gradually, through his work, becomes more responsible, but also develops the bourgeois values. So, Shweta tells everybody that he has no idea when Shente will return. Son appears and complains to Shweta about the way the farm is being run. Wang arrives, wishing that Shente would return, and announces that Shente told him before that she left and she was pregnant. Son is furious, and even he threatens Shweta that he will not let him to see her. Then he will complain that to the police. So policeman arrives, and then the policeman charges Shweta with keeping Shente under illegal restraint. So someone has heard that she is crying, and that complaint is lost. He soon discovers the policeman comes and searches the house, does not find. Shweta, Shweta is uh, Shweta is there. Shente does not find the female Shente, and finds the clothes that are hidden under the table. So Shente's clothes are discovered, and naturally the police arrest Shweta. Shweta is escorted escorted off to the magistrate's court. Once again, we find the gods appearing in to Wang in a dream. They are Crestfallen, they have found hardly any good people except for Shente. Finally, in the courtroom scene, the last episode of the play, 
we find the gods are disguised as magistrates, the policemen defend Shwita, as does the baker and the property dealer. The other people, especially the poor who were looting, looting Shente, they accuse Shwita of killing Shente. Finally, Shente is heard, uh, Shwita says that I will confess if people are not there. And finally, as you know, that in the final scene, Shwita reveals that, that he is not he, rather he is Shente, the woman. At the end of the play, we find the questions are raised. So the gods are shocked and they cannot accept the world. They know that the worlds need to be changed and they ascend to heaven on a pink cloud, telling Shente, only good and all will be well. The others enter and are amazed at the sight of the vanishing god. So Shente stretches desperately towards them as they disappear upwards, waving and smiling. So the epilogue of the play is most important. So as the play concludes, we have an epilogue. This epilogue apologizes for the play's resolution. There is no resolution at the end of the play. And this is very important for Brechtian theater. Usually in well made play, there is a resolution of the action. Dunama, catastrophe, there is a resolution of the action. In case of this play, there is no resolution of the action. Rather, this action is left. Okay, there is no resolution of the action. And here we find that the epilogue is sung. And what are the lines of the epilogue? There is only one solution that we know that you should know now consider as you go. So as the audience, they take their way home. They want to go out. The, the actors on the stage say that there is only one solution that we know that you should now consider as you go. What short sort of measures would you recommend? So it is not our recommendation, not the recommendation of the playwright. What should happen? So what sort of measures would you recommend to help good people to a happy end? So good people, how can they live a life that is happy? Ladies and gentlemen, in you we trust. So with your complex seeing, with your mature ability to understand things, each according to your need, each according to your purpose, your belief, your commitment and necessity. So ladies and gentlemen, in you we trust. There must be happy ending. Must, must, must. But this happy ending is not forced in the theatre. Rather, it is left open for the audience and they must, must, must search for a happy ending. So this is actually a parable play. Parable play of human identity. Okay, human beings in search for goodness, whether this type of goodness is possible in the world that is otherwise bad. So whether it is still possible, so we are still mulling over the problem. So bread, milk, rice, in the pandemic times, this has become worse. So is it possible for us to remain good in the most distressing of times? Is it possible for someone to remain good? So we are actually deluded by the illusions of the world and keep on carrying on those material benefits without thinking of the interconnections that have been there since long. So we think about the self without interconnecting with the other, with the outside world. In this networking of interconnection, the solidarity, the consolidation and the raising of consciousness can take place. And it is not the autonomous being that of an individual that creates the consciousness. Rather, according to Marx, according to Brecht, it is the social being of an individual that actually creates consciousness. With these few words, I would like to conclude my discussion on Rex, the good person of Sichuan. Thank you for remaining an audience for long. Okay, and may I now invite questions from you? So I will try to respond to the questions. Is my voice audible? Clear enough. Yes, sir. It is audible. Students, if you have any question, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Good evening, sir. Thanks for your heartful lecture. I am a student of Sri Agrashan Mahavidyala, Department of English. Sir, my question is, uh, why the poet choice this name, 
the epic theater he can also cho- choose this uh, choice another name yeah the selection for this type of theater is epische epic theater that means the theater that will produce some kind of epical representation okay the dimension will be epical but if of small stories so he found this as a word that is very catchy okay and will also be related to the format of narrative i said no in case of aristotelian theater it is the dramatic mode in case of brechtian theater it is the epical mode so when we go through the epical mode of narratives we find that stories are narrated characters are there action is dramatized but the stories are narrated perhaps brecht used this original word that is related to narratology okay the digesis means to tell the story in a way that will keep the dramatic action in actions impact more visible on the mind of the audience so that the audience can have the imprint and will not be swayed away by the action of a well made play so in a dramatic theater we are just caught by the drama caught in the action in case of epic theater we are always reminded that this action has contradictions and there is no resolution so the solution has to be come from your side from the side of the audience therefore we selected this term although this epic theater this term was further revised by bertolt brecht and he used the term dialectical theater for the scientific age okay i think that this term is more closer to the question that you asked for okay the suggestion that you gave and brecht has given the answer that instead of epic theater it is better to call these theater dialectical theater for a scientific age can you get the meaning dialectical theater for a scientific age in a dialectical theater we have a thesis we have an antithesis but there is no synthesis this synthesis is left for the audience each according to her preference each according to his belief commitment and necessity thank you sir thank sir, you Shank- have- yes shankar thank you Shank- shankar for raising this question yes shankar can i ask more question yes yes definitely sir can you uh, consider us some basic points about this epic theater yeah i talked about this features i talked about alienation effect as a keystone okay key word of epic theater the second word was gestus gestic stance okay third word was contradictions without contradiction there can be no progression so the audience will be left with a kind of boxing match type contradictory bout the resolution the result will be left to the audience and the audience should find the result they must 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 find a happy ending okay each according to the requirement this is an aspect the fourth aspect is the episodic structure of the play epic theater is an aristotelian aristotelian theater has a five act structure each action is tied together with a beginning a middle and an end okay six elements are there in aristotelian theater plot character thought diction melody spectacle arranged in a chronological order of importance in brechtian theater plot is not important character is not important okay these are not important what is important is dionoia okay the thought that is important and the thought that is not propagandist the author is not telling you that this is right this is wrong rather giving you both the versions the story like this story like that okay one side of the palm the other side of the palm now you will make your own resolution to get a conclusion to the story happy ending to the story okay the problems of the world are there there are so many problems so we the philosophers have been trying to solve okay we have been talking about the problems we have trying to solve the problems the problem now according to brex is how to solve the problem and for this solution he is not allowing the playwright to make his own solutions because the solution might be wrong rather he is leaving the audience to make solution a conscious choice and this choice will be done only when the audience recognizes his or her social being and develop a kind of consciousness i will be connected to the other each with natch means the other 
i with not i otherwise how will we say this class okay so we people we are there engaged if we are not interconnected with each other if we are not aware of the questions that we are facing okay if we do not discuss that we do not solve that we do not shout out our problems how can we solve the problems so brexton theater epic theater is meant to make the audience more aware of the theatrical experience and to engage in a proper political act of finding a solution so according to brexton every theatrical act is a rehearsal that requires a kind of political solution any other question uh i have uh, what's the mean of gesture and desperate song yes. okay the word that i use gestus g s t u s i use this word gestus g s t u s right write this yes. word g s t u s so this is yes. this is a word that has been translated wrongly into english as gesture g s t u r e okay for brexit gestus okay gestus is more than gesture okay so when we meet people we make polite meaningless nod okay good morning good evening so these gestures these are polite and meaningless on the theater if we keep on repeating those what impact will be that have that can produce some kind of effect but for brexit brexit was a believer of a minimalist theater where every theatrical action will be definitely related to the text so no type of action will be outside the text everything should be integrated to the text just for making the spectators laugh you cannot just introduce a farcical action rather every action should be tied together with the prominent or dominant gesture so this is the non verbal language okay theater has two languages one is called verbal language that means the language the dialogues the other is non verbal language so the non verbal language should also contribute to the making of the play and in this non verbal language brex introduced the word gestus okay it is of course a difficult term so it refers to something deeper a physical embodiment of the relationship between people and society so each gestus will capture a particular set of interlocking attitudes it will become a sum total of these and will be providing the audience with a chart of the society that is produced brex was influenced by the paintings of brugel have you seen paintings of brugel elder brugel so please see those paintings elder brugel say 100 proverbs he is presenting that in a single painting so all these 100 proverbs are presented in a kind of montage or collage and each action of characters that are related to the proverbs they are easily seen so understanding the gestures for any particular moment of an action is to catch the attention of the audience to that dominant mood as well as attitude the actor will therefore make the attitude visible to the gestures that is the task of the actor so whatever the actor wants to convey with the verbal language the actor does but also with abhinaya with the entire non verbal gesture and movement the actor will make that visible to the audience okay say if someone you must have seen the uh, movies of charles chaplin so when charles chaplin does something on the stage without the verbal he communicates with the non verbal with his action that is what brex wanted to introduce to the gestures okay gestures therefore is related to that type of acting a different type of acting style that we find in the movies of charles chaplin can i make things clear so charles chaplin communicates to us with his gestures okay every gesture is related to a story okay so mime thing also can be there yes mime pantomime hmm. all these are used dance okay just uh, jigging on the stage any kind of action that does not only produce laughter but also produces a kind of kind of image of that attitude of the person if say someone is hungry how do you represent that on the stage so it will be overacting okay overacting to show hunger but that hunger should be made visible through gestures okay if someone is doing business so the activity of that person should be business like okay like the reality 
but that should be exaggerated so, to such an extent that it becomes a theatrical action presenting the attitude of the actor towards the character making it visible so the alienation effect will be there the spectators will always think that this is a tramp okay this is a tramp behind the tramp there is charles chaplin okay if charles chaplin just walks in the street of new york no one will recognize because everyone is familiar with that image of charles chaplin but charles chaplin whatever he does on the stage on the screen is orchestrated that orchestrated acting style that will represent the dominant emotion dominant sentiment as well as attitude to that particular situation is called gestures okay can i make thing clear yes sir yes sir okay thank you very much because this is the most difficult term in brexton theater to explain so if you watch the movie do you want to see the play so let us let just we have time would you like to see the play yeah yes sir yes, sir. Last, yes sir okay last scene we will enjoy okay we will enjoy the last scene this is the production of the play that i have with me so i will directly telecast that from the youtube so you can see this play afterwards so let us have a visual so this is the last scene a good life i suppose is it audible and visible yes sir okay yes sir, oh, yes, sir. what have you done with the good to tell you evil man how many good people are there left illustrious ones she was certainly good when that barber broke my head She wanted to give evidence for me, and now I'm giving evidence for her. She was good, I swear it. What is wrong with your hand, water seller? Seems stiff. He's to blame, and no one else. She was going to give me the money for the doctor, and then he came along. You were her mortal enemy. I was her only friend. Where is she? Run away. Where to? I shan't tell. What made her go? I can't go on any longer. If the court can be cleared so that only the magistrates are present, I will give a confession. Confession. Who are you? Lord. Liar. My old bastard. You. They got a surprise coming. <laughs> Have they gone? All of them. I cannot go on any longer. Illustrious ones, I have recognized you. What have you done with our good person of Szechuan? Let me confess the frightful truth. I am your good person. Shen Tei. Yes, it is me, Shu Ta and Shen Tei. I am both of them. Your original order to be good will yet survive and split me like lightning into two people. I cannot tell what occurred. Goodness to others and to myself could not both be achieved. To serve both self and others, I found too hard. Oh, your world is arduous. Such need, such desperation. The hand which is held out to the starving is quickly wrenched off. He who gives help to the lost is lost for his own part. For who could hold himself back from anger when the hungry are dying? Where could I find so much that was needed if not in myself? But that was my downfall. The load of commandments forced me into the sludge. Yet if I broke the rules, I strode proudly round and could eat myself full. Something is wrong with this world of yours. Why is wickedness so rewarded, and why is so much suffering reserved for the good? Oh, I felt such temptation to treat myself kindly. I felt too a secret awareness inside of me, for my foster mother washed me with slops from the gutter, so I acquired a sharp eye. And yet pity brought me such pain that I at once felt wolfish anger at the sight of misery. Then I could feel how it gradually altered, and my lips grew tight. In heart, bitter as ashes, the kind words fell in my mouth. And yet I should gladly have been an angel to the slugs, for giving was still my soul's delight. A smiling face and I walked in the clouds. Condemn me. 
Each of my crimes was committed to help out my neighbor, or to love my beloved, or to save my young son from going without. Oh, God, for your vast projects, I, poor human, was too small. Speak no further, you unhappy creature. What are we to think who so rejoiced to have found you again? But don't you understand? I am the wicked person whose crimes you've just heard described. The good person, of whom no one speaks anything but good. No, the wicked person as well. A misunderstanding. A few unfortunate incidents. One or two hard-hearted neighbors, a little too much zeal. But how is she to go on living? She can manage. She is strong, healthy, well-built, and can endure much. But didn't you hear what she said? Muddled! Completely muddled! Hard to accept, extremely hard to accept. Are we to admit that our commandments are fatal? Are we to sacrifice them? Never. Is the world to be altered? How? By whom? No. Everything is as it should be. Now, we return to heaven. This little world still fascinates us. All its joys and hurts encouraged us or caused us pain. And still, we'll gladly think, away beyond the planets, of you. Shente, the good person we sought, who makes our spirits manifest down here. And through this bitter darkness bears the tiny lamp. Farewell. Good luck. Oh no, illustrious ones, do not go away. Don't leave me. How am I supposed to face the two old people who lost their money, or the water seller with his stick handed? How am I supposed to protect myself against the barber whom I don't love, and against Yang's son whom I do? And my body has been blessed. Soon my young son will be there and will be wanting to eat. I cannot remain here. You can manage. Only be good and all will be well. Show you respect. The gods have appeared among us. Three of the mightiest gods have come to Szechuan in search of a good person. They thought they had found one, but... No, but. Here she is. Shante! She was not dead. She lay but hidden. She will remain among you a good person. But I must have my cousin. Not too often. Once a week, anyway. Once a month, that will be enough. Oh, no, illustrious ones, do not go away. I haven't told you all. I need you terribly. All too long on earth we lingered, swiftly truths the lovely day, shrewdly studied, closely fingered, precious treasures melt away. Now the golden flood is dying, while your shadows onward press. Time that we two started flying, onward to our nothingness. Help! Now let us go. The search at last is over. We have to hurry on. They give three cheers and one cheer more for the good person of Szechuan. So I would like to conclude this lecture with this small audiovisual presentation. Any questions? Any further questions you have? Anyone has any question? Ah. I don't think, sir, anyone has any question. The reason okay, is once, such a... Yeah such a complex thing you have discussed in such a beautiful way and especially the last presentation it was absolutely apt for the entire discussion because the way you have presented all the ideas of Brecht, which is always a complex thing for us since the days of university when we started studying william beckett and then the Brecht in all the students of the university and today when my students got an opportunity to listen to such a wonderful lecture from your end who is absolutely a person meant for theater because when you delivered the lecture we could all visualize even though we haven't seen the play but still we could all visualize that the how 
the characters are being presented in the play. And sir, so only I, um, this is just uh, what I feel that is there any similarity between uh, Samuel Beckett and Bertolt Brecht? Any point of Yes, at the beginning of the lecture, I referred to the three great makers of 20th century theater, George Bernard Shaw, Bertolt Brecht and Samuel Beckett. Yes. So in Samuel Beckett's play also, we find an extensive use of the epic theater performance that Brecht introduced on the stage. Although some critics have placed uh, Samuel Beckett in the category of theater of existential revolt, or even Martin Eslin has wrongly placed Samuel Beckett as a practitioner of the theater of the absurd. absurd. I, personally, I personally recognize the importance of your question and feel that there are similarities. Both are working in the same way. And the questions uh, that are uh, raised by Samuel Beckett, especially in plays like Happy Days, Endgame, Crap's Last Tape, Waiting for Good, of course. Yes. So these are more challenging or exactly. more disturbing than those raised by Brext. For Brext, at least we human beings, normal or mortal human beings, they can have their resolutions. Exactly. We can have our happy end with must, 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 we can have. But in Samuel Beckett's case, these are multiplied. So contradictions are so wide, so various in the works of Samuel Beckett, that we, the audience, who are left to write the play, but cannot write the play. These are simply poetic, contradictory plays that Samuel Beckett has produced. And definitely the acting style, the same sources are used. Chaplin-esque, OK, the tram show, OK, the musical hall, music hall, the tradition of clowning, all these are used by Samuel Beckett. And Samuel Beckett himself directed some of his plays. And he did use the theatrical tradition that were introduced by Erwin Piscutter and Samuel and Bertolt Brecht. Thank you for raising this question. Thank you for giving me this opportunity for interacting with the students. I thank again Principal Dr. Jayita Bas, Madam, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, students. OK, you are learner, young learners. So you have such a vast world before you. And these are most interesting things that keep our literary studies, especially the performance studies, theatrical studies alive. And if possible, when things become normal, when you are in some other courses, if possible, perform these plays. So by performing, we understand the plays better, especially of Brexit. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so so uh, another question, sir, I have in my mind. Uh, sir, will you give me this opportunity to ask you the question? Or yes, sir. Sir, uh, this meta-theater concept that you discussed in Brecht's, we have seen this meta theater in uh, six characters in search of an author in Pirandello's uh, play also. So is there also, can I connect this uh, Pirandello with Brecht? Yeah, the term meta theater introduced by Lionel Abel in the Lionel. book called Meta Theater. Hmm. Okay, a vision of the dramatic arts. He's talked about this continuity of this meta theatrical tradition since the time of Aristophanes. Okay, in Aristophanes also, Say, for example, frogs. The characters are there who are inventing the agon. Agon means the idea, the main conflict. So protagonist follows the agon. The idea of Dionysus is to go down to hell to bring back a tragic playwright in order to solve the problem of the world. The entire play is seen as a play in the process of making. So this is seen even in Shakespeare's play, Hamlet. He stands and says that play is the thing wherein I will catch the conscience of the king. And then there's this inset play enacted by the players in Hamlet, producing the murder of Gonzago scene, the mouse trap, And the psychological test is given to Claudius and Gertrude. They react, of course. And then Hamlet has his reason to take revenge. So this can be seen in the Spanish tragedy, even in the Duchess of Malfi. A Midsummer Night's Dream contains an excellent meta theatrical event where throughout I the play I was about to say that only mix yeah, seven night stream throughout the play the playmakers are making the play and finally they set the play the piramis and thisbe play at the end of the play they perform that play 
So this six characters in search of an author by Pirandello, European practitioner of model, where characters, they start searching for the author and ask the author the question, why we are not included in the play? So this tradition was there in the theaters that developed later on, even in epic theater, as well as the theater of 1950s. So many plays, okay, Tom <coughs> Edwards, Rosencrantz and Gilderstone are dead. Okay, all these are meta-theatrical plays. So these plays are, are questioning the validity of the theater itself. It is un-Aristotelian, it is episodic, it questions the validity of theater, it talks about the uprootedness of theater from its traditional roots, placing the theater as it is, making the theater as an object of representation, and making theater more self-reflexive. Meta means beyond. So beyond the theater, theater is working in order to connect with the society. Everything is in full display. The spectators can see the playmaking in process, rehearsal in process. This play also includes this, the presence of Wong from the beginning to the end, through his dreams, through his encounter with the gods. Keep that meta-theatrical element alive. It is more about the playmaking. Okay, meta-theatres are about playmaking. And this good person of Sajwa introduced this question about goodness in a society and keeps on making plays around that idea. Thank you for raising this question. Yes. Thank you, sir. Hello. Uh, am I audible, Professor Bhaduri? Yeah, yeah, yeah. audible. Uh, uh, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Kumar Odhikari is uh, 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 from the history department, sir. He's going to ask you a question. Sir, please go ahead. Yes, yes. OK. Sir, thank you for your uh, beautiful lecture. Um, actually, uh, um, I, I am from history. Uh, so my, my question will be related to history. Uh, in our uh, student life, uh, we heard about some 18th century play of France, like uh, Marie Helene Huet, Barbara of Seville, the marriage of Figaro, like that. So my question is that, how far the French Revolution was influenced by the 18th century dramas? Simple question, sir. Yeah, I, I referred, referred to the works of Voltaire. Okay, in my lecture, I talked about that. And Voltaire was an influence yeah, yeah, on Brecht. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Voltaire was an influence on Brecht. So the same ideals of the Romantic period, okay, that went through the entire group of the German transcendentalists and the French revolutionaries, went into the making of the modern theater. Okay, the historical events are very important for Brexit. And as the, the student, I regard every teacher as a student of history, you must be aware, yeah, yeah. aware about, the, uh, about the concepts of writing history. So Brexit mm -hmm. theater is more about rewriting the history, not from the above, mm -hmm. but from the below. Okay, below. It is history from the below. From the below. Mm. It, is, it is a kind of writing, a history from the perspective of the masses. That's if the mass write history. Say in Mother Courage and Her Children, he is not taking the dominant history recorded by the European histories, historians on the civil war. Rather, he is using the story in a new way, using a contemporary work, Okay, a kind of um, cheap seller book, where he finds the story of an ordinary woman, a person who is exploiting the war in order to collect materials from the war field and selling that as commodities in the market. Even in life of Galileo, the dominant history of Galileo is replaced by a uh, subaltern history of Galileo. Means the stories that were in the heresy. Okay, the stories that were popular among the people. Stories that are scandalous in nature. These stories are taken by Brecht and placed in the play. So these type of alternative reading of history can be seen in the plays of Brecht. And of course, the 17th century playwright, 18th century playwright like um, John Gay, okay, an English playwright who was also influenced by the names that you said. Okay, so John Gay, an 18th century playwright in his Beggar's Opera, that was adapted as Threepenny Opera by Brecht later on, also introduced this type of alternative stories okay, of the common people. The working class takes the center stage in Brechtian play. Okay, the common ordinary people take the center stage in the Brechtian play. Okay, thank you. So I'm not a learned man in history. Okay, so I no, 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 fantastic lecture. I have, we have, but thank you for your illustrious lecture. So thank I, I worked, thank you I worked on Indian history. I worked on Indian history, especially a play called okay. Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb, Indira Parthia Sharati. He has written a play, no. Aurangzeb, based on uh, the history of medieval history, Aurangzeb's history. 
and there he has used the Brechtian style of historicization. Historicization, hmm. as you are a student of history, you know, is uh, removing removing the history from the present context and placing that history in that context of that historical period and analyzing that very objectively. So we cannot analyze with our 21st century perspective what happened during that Mughal period. So we have to be new historicist, placing that situation in that particular historical context in order to understand the history. And that Whoa. will itself reveal our contemporary situation. Usually in Brechtian parable plays, these are done. Caucasian chalk circle or a good person of Sejua, this has been done. These are parable plays, means the story is equal to another story. You can just put that story anywhere. Even in the pandemic time, if you put the story, you find that the story is almost similar because everything is typical, typical situation mm. taken from typical historical period and placed in a universal context. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Bhadari, for arranging such type of uh, talk. Thank you, Professor Bhadari. Thank you, Shonut, sir, for your inspiration. So we have uh, almost come to the end of this online lecture series that has been organized by our department. I'm immensely grateful to Dr. Shubho Prato Sharkar. He is my senior of Kalyan University, although I did not join university at that time. Later on, I joined. But he happens to be my guide. He always advises me in everything and in whatever problem that I face in he is the first person that I call to get some help. So I'm immensely grateful to you, sir, for giving up precious time with my students. Uh, we are from a very remote site. Our college is situated in a remote place. But we are fortunate that you gave us the consent to deliver a lecture in this virtual platform. And I'm sure all my students have enjoyed a lot and they have enriched. Even we also have enriched with your wonderful, with this wonderful lecture and with your vast erudition, sir. I'm also grateful to our honorable principal, Dr. Joita Basu, for her constant inspiration, motivation, and encouraging the department, all the departments of our college. She encourages all the departments of the college to organize such types of special lectures, webinars, which is incredible. Because when we get a, uh, support from the authority, we can always go ahead with our with in fulfilling these kind of desires that we have in our have in our heart and i'm also grateful to my to the colleagues of my department as well as to the colleagues of my college for joining this session and making this session a fruitful one and once again i extend my thanks to all the participants the students for your spontaneous participation interaction and enriching yourself in this session so once again thanks to all of you and here we come to the end of the session. Hope that after this pandemic situation gets over, we can always get you, sir, among physically in our college to deliver such wonderful lectures on drama and enrich our life and enrich the students. The students are really enthralled with your lecture because they already uh, requested with them, ma'am, there should be a recording of it. And we are going to refer to this recording later on when we would study the play properly before the exam. So thank you very much, everyone. So here we come to the end of the session. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, students, for your attention. Thank you, teachers. Thank you, madam. Thank you, everyone.